In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Other family, it's been a very full week, so I have to rely on our gospel from the ordinary form for our meditation today. It was the gospel where Jesus fed the, fed the people already, and at this point now he sends, he sends the apostles out in a boat. They're a couple miles out at sea, a storm hits, and, but while they're leaving, he, Jesus, he, Jesus takes time and, quote, dismisses the crowds. So have you ever wondered how that went down? It certainly was not like at the end of one of my all-time favorite movies, Ferris Bueller, when, if, you remember, if you've seen it, during the movie credits, he appears on the screen and he like looks right at you and says, you're still here? Go on. That would not have been the way Jesus would have dismissed the crowds. You know, I, I don't know if it's possible to even get a shadow of a glimpse of the divine love with which he dismissed the crowds, but it probably was in words similar to what the priest says at the end of the holy sacrifice of the mass in the you know, ita misa est, and then, uh, or in the ordinary form, go and announce the gospel of the Lord. That's the one I choose to say. Go and announce the gospel of the Lord. It probably was these words of our Lord to the people, something along the lines of, I fed you in body, and I fed you in spirit. Go now and be a light of Christ to everyone you meet. It's a profound meditation on what that gospel actually means. That one little line with such a short phrase of, well, Jesus dismissed the crowds. The second thing about that particular gospel, it came to me while I was proclaiming it yesterday in the Novus Ordo, was the fact that in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, fake theologians, both Catholic and Protestants, tried to say, remember, this is the one where our Lord goes walking out on the water and Peter climbs out of the boat and he starts to sink and he says, Lord, save me, he cries out. Some of these fake theologians, both Catholic and Protestant, tried to say that Jesus did not really walk on the water, that he was just walking along the shore, and that was just a way of saying it. No, that's rat poison, dear family. There was so much of it. It was rat poison. They asserted that Jesus, our Lord, was just on the shore so that there, was, there really wasn't a miracle. Indeed, there was. That is so 100% against the gospel. We can only wonder how they would dare to say such a thing. The boat in the gospel was miles out at sea. And the gospel expressly asserts that our Lord walked on the water. And when Peter got out of the boat, he didn't sink right away. He was walking on water, too, until he got distracted by all the storm. And then they both, after Jesus, after Jesus saved them, they both walked on water to get back in the boat. The short lesson we can take from that gospel is that we also walk by faith. With faith, we are not afraid. As our Lord said to Peter, do not be afraid. We don't, be, we don't have to be afraid because we believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, credo in unum deum. We believe. We know our hope is in the Lord who made heaven and earth. Under family, three years ago on this, what would be the 19th Sunday in Cycle A of the Novus Ordo, and probably about three months before, Zach encouraged me to celebrate in the extraordinary form. Glory be to God. Thank you, Zach. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I was here a month at St. James when I said then that I would speak to you, that I would teach you Catholic truth, the unchanged, unchangeable truth handed down faithfully for 2,000 years. Remember, it's not the Catholic Church's teaching, it's Jesus' teaching, and we just hand it down faithfully, unchanged and unchangeable. So now, as we have for the past three years, let's take the Gospels, all sacred scripture, and apply them to, as we've had to do in these, apply them to our desperate times, the very times our Blessed Mother warned us about, the very Russian era our Blessed Mother warned us about. Your family, in these desperate times, let us, like St. Peter, never forget 
the one thing we should do when faced with any peril, real and genuine, or as is the case right now, greatly imagined. We should now and always cry out as Peter did, Lord, Lord, save me. Now please recognize that I did not, that I did not urge you to say, Dr. Fauci, save me. I did not urge you to say, esteemed scientists, save me. I did not urge you to find your hope for safety and security in any mere mortal, but in and only in Jesus Christ, our Lord, for he is, for our hope is in the name of the Lord who actually did make heaven and earth. As St. Paul said it, whether we live or whether we die, we live and die in the Lord. And if we really are afraid of getting sick or dying, then we better do a reality check, not on our state of grace, but on our state of where we seem to be lacking in grace. But if I haven't listened to the best synopsis I have yet read or heard about all that is going on around us, the words written by John Horvat the second. Mr. Horvat is a scholar, researcher, educator, international speaker, and author. He's also vice president of the American Society for the Defense of Tradition, Family, and Property, also known as TFP. And he wrote a brilliant summation of what I called the fear demic. He coined this word, coronaphobia, which I quote in part. No one likes to say it, but what triggers coronaphobia is the Hobbesian fear of death that so haunts the modern mind. Now, in case you don't know, he's referring to that godless philosopher, Thomas Hobbes, best known for his book on social contracts, society under, under government agreed upon, entitled Leviathan. And Leviathan contains what is, what is perhaps one of the top five philosophical quotes of all time regarding human nature and the need for a government to preserve civil society. Hobbes postulates what life would be like without such a governor that government that would preserve civil society. He called it a condition which he, he calls the state of nature. And in the state of nature, there would be, quote, no arts, no letters, no society, and which is worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death. And then here it comes to your family, the quote of quotes. And the life of man would be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Well, there is, dear family, without government, the life of man would be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. If you're in philosophy, you have to memorize that. So John Horvat was spot on when he said, no one likes to say it, but what triggers coronaphobia is the Hobbesian fear of death that so haunts the modern mind. And then Horvat continued, just listen closely to his brilliant summation. Each person sees in a coronavirus death, his or her own possible death, this paranoiac fear causes demands that every possible means be employed against this remote threat, even if they appear excessive. This desperate drama creates conditions in which, in which people will even give up rights and liberties to avoid catching the virus. That, that's my sarcasm, not his. Chronophobia is caused by a society where the enjoyment of life is the supreme value. That is why the full might of the medical establishment, establishment must be mobilized with such passion. Everything must be done to prolong the lives of those who still enjoy life and have little thought about the hereafter. Coronaphobia explains why there is so much hype around the issue in a culture that adores pleasure, life-threatening viruses overwhelm and crush psyches, unaccustomed to thinking about death and suffering. People look for a way to escape this unpleasant reality. 
Coronaphobia can only be overcome by those who dare to think beyond the pleasures of life. And then Horvath speaks to what Pope St. John Paul II called the redemptive value of suffering. Salvifici Dolores, if you haven't ever read it, please get it, read it. It's not that long. It's the single best answer apart from Job I've ever seen that just helps us to understand the redemptive value of suffering. So Horvath continues, tragedy invites people to reflect on human mortality and contingency. Inside the silence of reflection, people find meaning and purpose for their sufferings. They find the courage to act effectively, embracing reality, not denying it. Above all, tragedy leads people to trust in God and his providence. He continues, the limitations of a purely secular society are made patent when tragedies of this sort strike. Humanity is left to its own devices and finds them woefully insufficient. Throughout history, when faced with tribulation, the faithful have had recourse to God and have found solace and aid. That is why the church has always played such a great role during times of calamity. So then he speaks to the governmental authorities, says, instead of prohibiting church services like they've done, thousand people in Walmart, nine in the church, instead of prohibiting church services, authorities should encourage the church to hold more. That's what they did in Poland. This trust is the only sure cure for the devastating coronaphobia that ravages the world. Amen, John Horvath, amen. Dear family, none of us knows God's greater purposes in all of this. His ways are above our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. So, though it be human nature to be sorrowful over the sickness and loss of mortal life, it is diabolical to dispense with God in any way, shape, or form and place our trust in science and scientists. So, well, how can we expect anything different, though, when we let them throw Jesus and throw prayer out of public schools in 1963? We're reaping what we sowed. We're seeing it and all the people all around us going nuts over the coronaphobia. Your family, it's through faith. Not that we blindly accept any storm and not do anything about it, but it's through faith that we can endure any storm, come what may, in a reasonable and rational way. And in our human weakness, the thing we need most when we're in the midst of the storm is Jesus in our boats. Well, all of the above, I just encountered this past week with a 30-year-old who gets Horvat's words on the one hand, but who is stuck, totally stuck, because he does not yet reach out to Jesus like Peter and cry, Lord, save me. Well, providentially, I ran into him. I was visiting his parents, didn't know he was going to be there. Haven't seen him since at least before ordination. And we entered into a conversation about these desperate times. And I swear, I don't think I started it. The conversation all came down to this. This person, not some mere spoiled kid, no. But someone who was educated, such as it was at Marquette University, and had about a decade's worth of work experience. And this person who hails from one of the holiest families I've ever known in my entire life is oriented toward mortal life, not toward immortal life. Consequently, he represents the many out there who insist on putting his whole trust in fallible scientists and scientific models instead of turning his eyes upon Jesus and ignores the truth that come what may, our time on earth is short. It could be, tom it could be tomorrow. We don't know. It's going to come like a thief in the night for any one of us. Our time on earth is short, but eternity is a very long time indeed. Wherefore this person, however, is 100% acceptable of any and all restrictions 
imposed by scientists, even as he acknowledged that there's no end in sight ever for this or any other pandemic. And even as he acknowledged that there is no end in sight for the ever increasing restrictions and is very content to let it all just evolve. Listen, be, between the, the 7.30 and the 9.30 mass, I saw where the head of the Federal Reserve in Minneapolis wants to literally shut down the entire economy for six weeks, just shut it down, 100% shut it down. But what does he expect us to, how do we expect to pay for food? What are we gonna do when we're all trapped up six weeks, cooped up again? This stuff that we're seeing in Seattle and Portland, that's just small potatoes. Listen, how about if every one of you who have bills, how about if I go get my Monopoly game and hand you a bunch of Monopoly money and say, hey, go pay your bills with this. That's what the Federal Reserve is doing. This three trillion they've already spent is Monopoly money. It's as worthless as Monopoly money. What does this guy think we're gonna do for six more weeks of absolute total shutdown? Is he out of his mind? That's not in the script, by the way. Monopoly money. Listen, dear family, it's monopoly money. The little checks we're getting in the mail is not backed by anything. It is monopoly money. Anyway, this, this friend was content, even enthusiastic, to let all these restrictions made by unelected bureaucrats. We didn't elect the guy that's head of the Federal Reserve made by unelected bureaucrats sitting in physical, sit, or those ones that are sitting in the physical health department evolve as they saw fit, without questioning the godlessness of the schemes, without questioning the myth of physical health or the obsession with life, which is here today and could be gone tomorrow. He was struck, he was stuck in the Hobbesian fear of death. He was stuck in exactly what John Horvat said, hear it again. Each person sees in a coronavirus death his or, own, his or her own possible death. And this paranoiac fear cause, causes demands that every possible means be employed against this remote threat, even if, even if they appear excessive. And this desperate drama creates conditions in which people will give up rights and liberties to avoid catching the virus. Coronaphobia is caused by a society where the enjoyment of life is a supreme value. It's not a faith approach. Heaven is our supreme value. First, last, and always, it's heaven. Then, as Horvath continued, that is why the full might of the medical establishment must be mobilized with such passion. Everything must be done to prolong the lives of those who still enjoy life and have little thoughts about the hereafter. Under family and what was an entirely impromptu beginning to the infamous homily of May 12th, I spoke of thoughts that had struck me while showering up and getting ready to come to Holy Mass on a Tuesday morning. How it came to me in the morning shower, how everyone was so afraid of dying. And the answer that came was, quote, this quote from May 12th, that they don't believe in the afterlife. So the reason why they were clinging so tenaciously to making sure that nobody gets sick, they're afraid of dying. But we are not afraid of dying. Hopefully we are in a state of grace when we do, because something better is coming. But for godless people, the godless left, the socialist, communist left, Hollywood, etc., they fear dying because that's all they have, end quote. Back to this providential run-in with the 30-year-old. And I emphasize that age, dear family, because most everyone that age and younger is inculcated with a godless philosophy of life. So get it straight, the sheer number of such voters running around, living life with that philosophy, they're perfectly content to take your freedom, especially your religious freedom, and throw it into the dumpster. Be afraid. And as it is with all such belief systems, we're seeing the most zealous adherence to that belief system, rioting, looting, burning, and shooting. We are seeing the most zealous adherence trying to destroy Portland, Seattle, and indeed the whole country. Understand, dear family, who and what and how many we are seeing. Again, back to this 30-year-old, consistent with all this truth, 
This person even acknowledged that we in our culture will spend the last penny, the utmost penny, to preserve the last possible moments of life, which just confirmed exactly what I said about this godless fear of dying. All the while, this person, while acknowledging the focus on the nth degree of physical health, disregarded, just like the physical health scientists, any genuine concern with mental health and any concern at all with spiritual health, such as depression from unnecessary economic devastation, such as rage as played out in the streets of so many blue cities, such as suicide, which exceeds coronavirus deaths now, suicide from the hopelessness this all creates. But despite the fallacies of the face mask mandate we pondered last week, this person was 100% on board with universal, mandatory universal masking, even though there's no science that supports it, but only mere speculation. In fact, I was looking at some CDC stuff this past week, someone sent it to me, that admitted that there's over a decade's worth of data that provided no support for the proposition that face masks had a significant impact on the spread of the flu. So let's look at the truth about the coronaphobia. Let us ponder what I termed a couple weeks ago as the fear demic, with which we are being bludgeoned into submission and about which this person had so much fear. Recently, the H1N1 virus resulted in 60.8 million cases in the US. No panic whatsoever, no shutdown of the economy whatsoever, and China was blamed as it should have been. But today, the US claims I just saw it between masses now it's up to 5 million cases that they're claiming. But they know and they've admitted and they've stated forthrightly that at least it's overstated by at least 25%. So we're less than 4 million. We're in the 3 million range, if even fact that's true. But just look at the fact that the governor of Ohio tested positive and then shortly thereafter tested negative. Your family, if the, if the scientists can't get it right with such a VIP, such a very important person as a governor, what makes us think that they've gotten it right in any other of these millions of cases that they claim? And yet, and yet, unlike the H1N1 response to 60.8 million cases, our city, our state, our country, and the world is in panic mode. And not surprisingly, instead of blaming China from whence it came and who lied about it, Left-wingers are blaming Trump. Some stuff you just cannot make up. Now, please, dear note, note, dear family, some people out there have complained about alleged polit politics in some of these meditations. And when they do, when you hear them complain, just quote them, the great Pope Benedict XVI, who, for about, who was the head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith for about 21 years under Pope St. John Paul II, and then was himself elevated to be the vicar of Christ for eight years. Pope Benedict XVI said, quote, the church is not a political power, it's not a party, but it is a moral power. Therefore, since politics fundamentally should be a moral enterprise, the church in this sense has something to say about politics. Therefore, dear family, according to Pope Benedict the 16th, when politics and politicians act in an immoral way, we most certainly do have a duty and an obligation to speak up and speak up about it. And when the Russian error bludgeons us with governmental control of every aspect of our lives, lived in community with others as it's supposed to be, the church most definitely has a duty to speak up and speak out. And failure to do so, failure to do so leaves the faithful without moral guidance in the midst of these desperate and dangerous times. By the way, dear family, when so many people out there express distrust for bishops who ostensibly are guided by Almighty God's highest morality, why on earth do these same people put so much trust in earth princes? <coughs> in earth's princes, godless scientists who are not guided by almighty God's 
highest morality. So let us, through the grace of God, get our heads on straight by taking that gospel passage of Peter climbing out of the boat, walking on water in the midst of the storm, and applying it to everything that is going on around us. And just one sentence from that sacred scripture should have been, should be now, and in the future, always should be at the forefront of our minds. Peter left whatever safety might have been in that boat, and he started toward Jesus. Then he took his eyes off Jesus, and he started to sink, and he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught Peter and said to him, oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? Your family, when it comes to faith in the midst of the storm, why do we doubt? Even if the storms actually threaten our lives. And dear family, it is a lie to say that COVID-19 threatens our lives because it does not. When 99.75 or roughly about that number recover with some, with most without even a sign or a symptom, that's not a threat to our lives, such as requires the shutdown of the globe and the intense suffering, mental and spiritual. It's not a threat, it's a lie. But even if the storms actually did threaten our lives, even if it did, well, every pandemic before or after will cause some loss of life. I mean, all we welcome to the world after the fall of Adam and Eve, it is not paradise anymore. Death came into the world. We can't avoid it. So let us in the midst of any threats to life, and more importantly, our threats to faith, especially the Russian threat, which is far more dangerous to our eternal souls than COVID-19 ever could dream of being. Let us, let us keep our faith and hope in the Lord who actually made heaven and earth. And if the storm gets too scary, all we have to do is turn our eyes back upon Jesus and cry out like St. Peter did, Lord, save me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.